So permutations are fun. Permutations are classifiable. But what we'll find out now is that permutations are super important. Because permutations are not just interesting to study from the standpoint of abstract algebra. In a very real sense, permutations are abstract algebra. And what I mean by that is that if we can understand permutations well enough, it turns out that we can understand any finite group pretty well. Because as we'll see in this video, any finite group is the same as a subgroup of some permutation group. So if you hand me any finite group at all in the world, no matter how ridiculous its properties might be, if it's a finite group, I can find that finite group living within some group of permutations. So if I can understand permutation groups, I go a long way to understanding all finite groups in general. And that's really something. Let's see how it works. Those of you that enjoyed our work with Cayley tables uh, early on, trying to understand how groups are defined and how they work, you'll appreciate this discussion. Because the same Cayley that we credit with those tables, we also credit with this theorem called Cayley's theorem. I like to think of it as the every finite group theorem. It says that if I have a finite group of order n, then there exists a subgroup of Sn, the symmetric group on n symbols, and that subgroup is the same as G. We're not going to come up with a formal proof of this right now because we've still yet to formalize this notion of sameness uh, in a way that's going to be useful for a proof. We're going to do that in the next couple of chapters. Um, but what I want to do is give an argument for why this theorem is true using Cayley tables. So here's a group of four elements that we studied at one point in class. Right? These are the, the complex numbers, 1, negative 1, i, and minus i, with the operation of multiplication. Those four elements form a group that has this Cayley table. And the idea for why we can understand this group, whose elements look nothing like permutations, why we can understand it as being the same as a subgroup of a permutation group of four symbols, is that we know, based on the properties that a group has, based on the cancellation property, which follows from the uniqueness properties of identities and inverses, based on that property, we know every Cayley table cannot repeat an element in any row or in any column. Right? Every Cayley table is a Latin square of its elements. And for that reason, every row in this Cayley table is a permutation of the first row. And every column in this Cayley table is a permutation of the first column. Once you realize that, you can see why it is that permutations lurk within any Cayley table for any finite group that I could write down. So for example, if I look at the row which begins with the identity element in this group, the number one, I can think of the elements on that row as being a permutation of the elements of my group G. And I can write it in stack notation just like this. Well, what permutation is suggested by this stack notation? What I'm saying is that left multiplying the elements of this group by 1 affects a permutation of those elements. 1 times 1 gives me 1. 1 times negative 1 gives me that. 1 times i gives me i. 1 times minus i gives me minus i. And so the action of left multiplication by this element gives me the permutation in which every one of these elements stays put. In other words, it gives me the identity permutation, which we can just write with a, a pair of empty parentheses if we want to use cycle notation. So we're associating to the element 1 in my group the permutation, which leaves all of the four elements of its set in place. We can do that same process for the other four elements of the group as well. What happens when I left multiply by negative 1? I'm going to get a permutation that sends this element into that position. One, negative 1 times 1 gives me negative 1. Negative 1 times negative 1 is going to give me 1. So when I multiply by negative 1, these two elements are trading places with one another. Same thing with these two elements, i and minus i. When I multiply by minus 1, they trade places. So the permutation that I get there is the permutation which has cycle notation 1, 2, followed by 3, 4. So that permutation is now going to stand in for multiplication by negative 1. What about multiplication by i? What's going to happen over here? Well, if I multiply i times 1, I'm going to get i. i times minus 1, minus i. i times i, negative 1. i times minus i, 1. What permutation is that? Well, that ends up being a 4 cycle. 1 goes to position 4. 4 goes to position 2, 2 goes to position 3, and 3 goes back to position 1. So that's the 4 cycle, 1, 4, 2, 3.
Finally, what about left multiplication by minus i? Left multiplication by minus i is going to send 1 from position 1 into position 3 here. And then 3 goes to 2, 2 goes to 4, 4 goes back to 1. So this permutation can be denoted 1, 3, 2, 4. So what I've just done is taken each one of the elements of my group and identified what permutation of the first row of my Cayley table is affected by multiplying on the left by that element. So at the end of the day, what I've just done is I've set up a function which has as its domain my group G that has these elements, and its range is a set of four elements of S4, four permutations. The identity permutation, this 2 plus 2 cycle for negative 1, and these four cycles for i and minus i. What we've just done is constructed what algebraists call the left regular representation of this group. And I know that sounds like an intimidating mouthful, and it is, but now you know exactly what it means. It's the process of representing each one of the elements of some abstract group by a permutation via its left representational action on itself, its left multiplication action on itself. In other words, what happens to the elements in this group when I multiply them on the left by each one of these things? What permutation happens to the first row of the Cayley table? So what's great about this is it also means that this set of four elements will be a subgroup of S4. Why? Because all the closure identity and inverse properties that the group G has all of those properties are also going to be satisfied by this subset of elements of S4. And therefore, G is the same as this subgroup of S4. These permutational elements here interact in exactly the same ways that the elements of my original group interact with one another. So this is truly the power of Cayley's theorem, is that we can locate inside of S4 a subgroup of elements that behave in exactly the same way that the four elements of this group behave. So permutations are, in a way, the Rosetta Stone of finite groups. If I understand permutations well enough, I can then locate any finite group inside of a permutation group uh, and understand it better. We also get out of this, for free, a way of representing elements of a group by matrices because we know how to represent permutations by matrix multiplication, as we saw a few videos ago. So I want to close by doing that. If I represent each one of these permutations by uh, a, a permutation matrix, right, a row-swapped version of a 4x4 four four identity matrix, then that will indicate that I can also use these matrices to represent the elements of my group, my original group G. So here's a 4x4 four four identity matrix for the identity permutation of S4. 1, 2, 3, 4 means swap the first and second rows and the third and fourth rows of the identity matrix, and we get a matrix that represents this permutation. Similarly with 1, 4, 2, 3, we'll do those row swaps uh, to get this permutation matrix, and 1, 3, 2, 4 gives me that permutation matrix. So what all of this means is that this set of four 4x4 four four matrices will also be a subgroup of the group of all invertible 4x4 four four matrices of real numbers. But then this subgroup, so these four matrices, behave in exactly the same way as these four permutations, which behave in the same ways with one another as these four elements of our original group. So because I can represent permutations by matrix multiplication, and because I can represent any group, finite group, by permutations, that means I can represent any finite group by matrices in this way, and get a representation of that group. You can check, for example, that because i squared is equal to negative 1, this matrix multiplied by itself is going to equal that matrix, and so on and so forth. And this is the first step in a very long story in abstract algebra called representation theory. Representation theory is where you ask the question, for a given group, how do I find linear transformations, i.e. matrices when that group is finite, how do I find linear transformations that act the same ways as the elements of that group do? Because studying linear transformations is relatively straightforward. We have a lot of tools from linear algebra for doing that. Representation theory tells me that I can translate a lot of questions about abstract algebra over into questions about linear algebra and study them there. That's the real power behind representation theory. And for finite groups, we can use matrices to do so.
Um, this isn't the only way to represent elements of a group by matrices, but it's one way, and it's the beginning of a long story of representation theory. But the point of this video is that symmetric groups are super important because of Cayley's theorem, because any finite group in the universe can be located as a subgroup of some symmetric group. And the Cayley table is the way to suggest the process in which we do that. So you might want to take this and take your favorite other group that we've looked at this semester, take its Cayley table, and figure out what permutations are suggested by left multiplication of the elements in that Cayley table. That realizes for us a subgroup of Sn that behaves in exactly the same way as our original group did.